Glad everybody could be here for the worship service this morning. And our first song is number 722, if you'd please turn there. Number 722. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land, climb the steams and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command, Jesus Jesus save, sing above the battle's dry. Jesus save, Jesus save, by his death and endless light. Jesus save, Jesus save, sing it softly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves sing and dry and for the tomb jesus save jesus save give the winds a mighty voice jesus save jesus save let the nation now rejoice Jesus save, Jesus save, shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest cave, this our song of victory, Jesus save, Jesus saves. And please turn to 193. Number 193, we'll ask Andy to lead us in prayer after the song. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak. But thou art mighty, hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fire. Whence the healing water flow? Let the fiery, cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. Strong deliverer, be thou still strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bend my anxious fears subside. Bear me through the swelling current, lend me safe on Canaan's soil. Songs of praises I will ever give to thee songs of praises I will ever give to thee. Please, <clears throat> please pray with me. 
Our Father in heaven, we bow before your throne of mercy and grace. We praise you, O God, because you are our creator. You gave us life and hope of eternal life through your son, Jesus. We thank you for these blessings, Father. We thank you for the fact that you have given us a way to worship you. And we pray that our worship today might be acceptable to you. We thank you for every blessing that we have because we know that they all are a blessing from you, the giver of all good things. We pray, Father, that you will bless us in our worship today, that we might truly put aside the thoughts of the world and concentrate on what we are doing and how we are worshiping and to truly worship in spirit and in truth. And Father, we have many of the congregation in other parts of the world that need your healing hand and blessing. We pray that you'll be with those that are sick, maimed, suffering from accidents or other illnesses or, or injuries. And we pray that you'll bless them as only you can, the true and living God. Father, we pray now that you'll continue with us as we truly worship you as you've directed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn to number 384. Number 384. And Kurt will lead us as we take the communion together. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning that we have been instructed to do, there are some things that come to mind and my focus on my comments 
uh, this morning is going to be on redemption. This might be a poor illustration, but in a sense, just as when someone has put something into a pawn shop and they hold it until that individual comes back to redeem it, if you will. So when we sin, we're removed from the opportunity, if you will, to be with the Lord. And somehow or other, those sins need to be redeemed or paid for. There needs to be a sacrifice. And as we know, Christ is our sacrifice. And a lot of the time, when we think of the, the Lord's Supper, uh, we think about the agony and the suffering that he experienced in sacrificing himself for us. But as I've said before, as Christ said, we're to do this to remember him. Well, what is it that we're supposed to remember? Is it the agony and the suffering we're supposed to remember? And, and all of that nastiness that took place there? I think in a broader picture, our remembrance of him needs to be in the context of what he did for us and how he redeemed us. I'm going to cover a few scriptures very quickly that focuses our minds on this. In Romans, in chapter 3, we can read, beginning with verse 21, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. The emphasis, and we're all familiar with this in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need to be saved. We need to be redeemed. Continue with verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through... Notice the word redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation. We spoke about that this morning. A propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate that at the present time his righteousness and that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Very quickly, Ephesians, this is emphasized in Ephesians uh, 1 and verse 7. In him we have again the emphasis, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. It's emphasized again in Colossians in chapter 1, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Um, Hebrews expands on this just a little bit in uh, chapter 9, beginning with verse 13. It says, therefore, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, my emphasis, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator. Boy, I'm glad he is a mediator. 
stands between me and God. He is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death, emphasis again, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant for those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So as Luke says, to sum this up, as Luke says in chapter 22, speaking about the, the institutional, the, the institution, if you will, the beginning is what I'm trying to say um, of the Lord's Supper. In chapter, in um, verse 15, he says, And then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Verse 17, Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Verse 19, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Lord, as we pause now and remember all that you have done for us and the work that you did throughout your lifetime, we thank you, Lord, that we're able to gather around this table this morning as you have instructed us to, to remember you and how uh, your body hung on that cross and was broken and how you suffered and sacrificed yourself to redeem us. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray that as we partake of this, we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. Our Father in heaven, thank you for gathering us here this day to this memorial feast where we remember Christ Jesus, our Savior, who gave his life that we might be, that we might gather with you in heaven one day as we follow his teachings and his love for you and love for all mankind. Amen.
Would you pray with me, please? Well, Lord, once again, we come to you in prayer and thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you especially, Lord, for how you watch over us daily as we go through our lives, how you providentially take care of us and provide for us. We thank you now, Lord, that we have this opportunity to report, return a portion of our blessings to you, that these funds might be used locally from this congregation to further your word in this area. We pray that you would bless both the gift and the giver. In Christ's name, amen. before uh, Michael speaks to us this morning. Uh, please turn to 396, number 396. And then Brendan will have our scripture reading after the song. to reach the masses, men of every birth. For an answer, Jesus gave the key. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Lift him up, lift him up.
The invitation song will be number 262, if you'd please mark that, 262. I will be quoting from Luke 13, 3. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likely perish. Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a beautiful day to see all of your smiling faces sitting down there. You know, uh, I was talking to my wife yesterday and I said, you know, I, I used to love the snow. Yes, past tense. You know, when I lived in Colorado, sometimes we would get like six foot of snow in one day. And we would literally have to dig our ways out of our front door in order to go to school and drive our snowmobiles, sorry, snow machines to school because that's how much snow we had. But then three days later, it would all be melted off and we'd have a few days of grass on the ground and then we would get some more snow later on that week. Here, it just never stops, it's unrelenting. <laughs> anyway, I just had to feel that emotion with you. All right, <laughs> so over the last couple of weeks, we've been going over the path to salvation. A couple of weeks ago, we covered the first step on the path to salvation, which is hearing the word. And we brought to light the fact that this hearing is a kuo, which is to hear with an understanding, like taking notes and really paying attention, studying what you are hearing. Then last week, we went through the second step on the path to salvation, which is believing in the word, believing that Jesus is the word, that the word is God, that Jesus came to this earth in the flesh, that he died for us and was resurrected. And that belief is the only belief that can bring us to salvation. This week, we're going to talk about the third step on the path to salvation, which is repentance. Because in order to come to salvation, repentance is necessary. I'm not sure if many of you remember your childhoods. I have a hard time sometimes bringing up different childhood memories. Um, but I remember when I was a child, because we all do this, Every time I would get in trouble, I would either plead my case for why I did it, or I would blame it on someone else. I mean, that's just the way it was. We were, we were kids. We never wanted to take the blame because we knew what that meant. At least back in my day, we knew what that meant. I don't know what today's children uh, get. But eventually, I would apologize for what I had done. Usually, it was after a spanking, or multiple spankings, or... <laughs> or being put into a timeout or something of that nature. But my question is, was I actually sorry? Or was I just sorry that I got caught and got punished? I mean, were, were any of us sorry when we were children? I mean, truly sorry that we had done something. I'm sure everyone has had moments like these in their lives. We all have, we were all children once. One of the hardest things to do is to admit when we are wrong. Even today as adults, it's hard to admit when we're wrong. It's easier to try to make excuses and blame someone else. Sometimes we even convince ourselves we didn't do anything wrong and we believe that we're the victims. <laughs> the truth is, we are not the victim. In all of our wrongs, God is the victim. Instead of blaming others for our wrongdoing or trying to prove that something we did wrong was right in our own eyes, we need to learn from the wrong and fix the problem and have a change of mind to never do it again, ever. If we instead practice true sorrow for what we have done and work to fix it, things will turn out for the better every time. This is called repentance. In the same way that repentance in life can change a relationship with a father or mother or best friend or a brother, repentance can also change our relationship with God. As a matter of fact, in order to come to salvation and have a relationship with God, repentance is necessary. Let's look 
Uh, Luke chapter 13, real briefly. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Luke chapter 13 and verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. No sin is, one above, is above another sin. All sin is equal in God's eyes. He puts in Revelation 21 and 8, lying is the same thing as murdering. All sin is equal in God's eyes. Today we're going to take a look at what true repentance requires. Repentance requires a recognition of one's own sin. And it requires an action to change. Though we may accept the punishment for what others say we have done wrong, in order to truly repent, we must recognize that what we have done is wrong. Thus, repentance requires a recognition of sin. Now, in order to fully understand that, I just want to bring out the definition of the word sin. Sin, according to Dictionary.com, is an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. Sin in the Greek is hamartia or amartia, okay? And this, according to Strong's Dictionary, is a missing of the mark, a failure to do rightly or completely, specifically a moral failure, a wrongdoing, an infraction, a misdeed. I want us to look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 and consider what is said there. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. <clears throat> 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Man's law, God's law. If you're not following the law... You are sinning, period. Let's also consider James chapter 1. Turn back to James chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. But every man is tempted. This is before this, he says, we can't be tempted by God. God doesn't tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So sin is a transgression against the law. It is to miss the mark that is given completely, to practice lawlessness, which leads us, or one of us, or any of us, or all of us, to death. That's what sin is. And the Philippian jailer, I believe, is a a great example of someone who recognized their sin. Let's consider Acts chapter 16. Turn with me back there. Let's look at the Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 25. At this point in time, we know that Paul and Silas are thrown into prison because they were teaching God's word. And this is what happens when they are in the prison. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening of his sleep, falling asleep as a prison guard back then was a death sentence, just so you know. And seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. 
And they speak unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized he and all his straight way. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, oh, sorry, we'll stop there in verse 34. Now in this, we see that the jailer was ignorant of what he was doing wrong. Clearly, he didn't know that he was doing something wrong other than sleeping on the job. <clears throat> we read in verse 29 that he recognizes what he is doing wrong. Look at verse 29. Then he called for a light and sprang in, and he came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Why would you tremble and fall down before these men if you had not recognized that you were doing something wrong? Now look in verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is us seeing the Philippian jailer here with a repentant heart. He is sorrowful in his heart for the wrong that he has just fell down before these men and knew that he had done. And he's asking, what am I supposed to do to be saved? Only someone with a repentant heart would ask a question like that. Let's read verse 33 then. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. He put his repentance into action. Let's then turn our, our attention to another example. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Go back to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> this is where uh, there's an account of Peter's first use of the gospel, preached to many of the Jews that had taken part in the Lord's crucifixion. A lot of the Jews on Pentecost were there when Jesus was being crucified. We read of Peter proving through the resurrection that Jesus is the Lord and Christ. Look at verses 29 through 36 here of Acts chapter 2. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would rise up Christ to sit on his throne. <laughs> Excuse me. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, Peter says. Therefore, you have to remember that we are only... Uh, seeing that Peter is speaking. But earlier, we know that it's all of the apostles that are speaking at this time. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let of all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he begins by proving to them that Jesus is the Christ. The people then recognize their sin and ask, what are they supposed to do? Look at verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked to the heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Can you imagine 3,000 souls screaming this out? What are we supposed to do? <clears throat> Peter then preaches unto them exactly what they must do. Continue in verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, what? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So we see that they recognize their sin. They are asking what they're supposed to do, and Peter tells them exactly what they're supposed to do. Now, let's move to our third example. Our third example is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Turn there, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. <clears throat> Here we read of Paul writing unto the church at Corinth of repentance. Paul writes that he has no regret over their sorrow. In verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 8. 
For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. He's not sorry that he wrote them this letter that led them to sorrow. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. But Paul rejoices in their sorrow. If you continue reading, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not, oh, sorry. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Repentance, being sorry in a godly manner. Although this is applying to people who are already Christians, I believe the same premise is applied here for repentance. We must recognize that there needs to be a change of mind in order for repentance to happen. Look at verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in the matter. They had a change of mind in order to get okay for Paul to be able to say that they were clear in this matter. So it is clear that a true repentance not only requires a recognition of our sin, but repentance requires an action to change. Repentance in the Greek is mataneo. And according to Strong's Dictionary, it is a change or reversal of one's mind to have a change of mind and heart to reconsider and to relent. <clears throat> Through our repentance, we are to be transformed. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our repentance is a renewal of our mind to prove what is good of God. That is what we're supposed to do, have a godly sorrow that leads us to repentance, a changing of our mind. Let's read another idea of repentance in 1 Peter. Turn with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Our repentance changes us from those children of sin to those who are holy that are trying and striving to walk in the light every day. As a matter of fact, we can read in the scripture where repentance is not just a suggestion. It's a command by God. Look at Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 30. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 30. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, to change your mind, to walk in the light from the darkness. That's our command, to have a godly sorrow. Why? Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. We repent because it's commanded, and one day we'll be judged according to that sorrow that we have, that repentance that we have. Now let's come back to the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. Go back just one chapter to Acts chapter 16 again. <clears throat> and we're going to read of the Philippian jailer's change of mind. Now Paul speaks to him and his whole household and tells them that they need to believe. Look at verse 31, Acts 16, 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Paul then teaches them exactly what they need to believe in the next verse. 
<clears throat> and they spoke unto him, what? The word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So he said they needed to believe and then he told them exactly what they needed to believe, the word of God. <clears throat> we finally see the change of mind in action leading to salvation in verses 33 and 34. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, a change of mind leading to action. He washed the stripes that they were given and was baptized, another change of mind leading to action. And he and all his straight way. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, another repentance. He's helping them. He's sorry for what he's done. And now he's feeding them and rejoiced believing in God with all his household. So he didn't just say, fall down before them, say, I'm sorry, what do I need to do to be saved and be taught? And then he was baptized. No, he continued to show his repentance and his walk, rejoicing as he did it. Now let us take a look back at the men that were at the crucifixion of Christ. As we begin to see their change of mind in verse two and, uh, chapter 2 and verse 37 of Acts, when they ask, what shall we do? We see a further change of mind in the people as we read of their action towards this belief in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. A change of mind leading to an action. And that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's amazing. I wish we could witness something like that today. 3,000 souls repenting and coming to God. We can read of the final and full change of mind of those being taught through their actions. Look at verse 42. And through their repentance, through their action to be baptized and be saved, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued in this always. That's a part of your repentance continuing in God's word, never turning back to the darkness, never looking back. It says in the Old Testament, the one that pushes the plow and looks back is not worthy of God. We never look back. We walk in the light as he is in the light. They went from those that were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, to believing on Christ and following his teachings. This proves to be a true transformation of one's life. Could you imagine being one of the apostles that day? And seeing all these people, especially Peter, because he was denying Christ left and right. And seeing all these people that were screaming to crucify your Lord and Savior, now asking forgiveness of him and repenting and being baptized. I mean, it almost brings tears to my eyes thinking about, thinking about how God can forgive anybody, even the ones that killed his son. We now return to those at the Corinthian church. They were showing themselves to have changed. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and beginning in verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 beginning in verse 11. <clears throat> this is how they showed themselves to change. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sword. We, we know that the sorrow has to be of a godly so sword. Not just, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to do it again tomorrow. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. They have had such a change of mind, a change of ways, a godly sorrow, that they have made themselves to be clear in the matter. And because of their repentance, Paul can proudly say in verse 16, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. What a blessing to be able to hear that straight from the Apostle Paul. That because of their godly sorrow and their change of mind to do the right thing, he can rejoice, therefore, and have confidence in them in everything. I pray that God can say that about me, that God can say that about all of us. And I'm sure most of you have, uh, let, let's slow it down and change gears a little bit. Most of you have probably seen the Andy Griffith show. Um, I'm not super old, but I'm old enough to say that I have watched every single episode of the Andy Griffith show probably more than once. But I want us to think about episode 101 entitled Opie the Birdman. Some of you might actually remember this one. Opie Taylor gets a BB gun and he's so excited. 
Opie has fun just pretending to shoot at people and other outdoor targets. Suddenly he notices something in a tree in his front yard and he takes aim and he shoots. Pew! Much to Opie's surprise, a bird falls to the ground. At first, Opie refuses to believe that the bird is dead. He tries to help it fly away by picking it up and tossing it in the air. He pleads for it to fly. Please, bird, fly, just fly away. When he realizes that he, he has killed the bird, he is completely devastated. And if you've seen the episode, you know he is because tears are just streaming poor Opie's face. He runs sobbing to his room. And later, after a conversation with his father, Opie realizes that he has the responsibility to right his wrong. He then begins to care for the baby birds left behind, feeding and watching over them until they are able to fly away and be on their own. This acceptance of our sins, of our wrongs, and then doing everything within our ability and with the support of God to make the situation right or better is what repentance is about. You don't just recognize what you've done is wrong. You do everything in your power to change it and never do it again. That's repentance. One must recognize their sin and take action to change their lives because in order to come to salvation, repentance is necessary. So let me ask you a question. Have you truly repented? Have you had a complete change of mind and heart to be innocent in all matters, as Paul says? Remember, repentance is not just saying you are sorry, but showing that you are sorry with a godly sorrow every single day. You have heard the word which leads you to faith. Romans 10, 17, because faith can only come by hearing God's word. You must believe this word and that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, come to set you free from your sins. John 8, 24. You must believe. As we have studied today, you must act on what you have heard on your faith and belief and repent of your past life because God commands it. Acts 17, 30. You must confess this belief before men and Christ will confess you before his Father in heaven. He's not going to confess you before this confession that you make. And that's our lesson next week, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Then you must be baptized, a complete immersion under the water, being buried with Christ in the likeness of his death and resurrected with him out of the watery grave, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, and God will add you to his church, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Finally, we must all live faithfully to Christ, walking in the light for the rest of our lives, 1 John 1, 6 and 7, and then we will receive a glorious crown if we do that until the end of our days, Revelation 2, 10. If you are ready to follow the Lord's commands, the waters of baptism are ready for you. Or if you need the prayers of encouragement from the saints, we're here for you. Remember, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer works. We want to pray for you if you need it. Don't be embarrassed to come ask. Whatever you need, please come forward as we stand and sing.
sit down. Our closing song will be number 394, 394. And then Brian will lead us in closing prayer and uh, bring a few announcements. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. dread what have I to fear leaning on the everlasting arm I have blessed peace with my Lord so near leaning on the everlasting arm leaning leaning safe and secure from all Bow with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, we are once again so thankful, so honored and privileged that we are given this great opportunity to be here today, to be able to worship you, to sing praises to you, to be able to help each other, to uplift each other. Dear Lord, we just pray now that as we depart from here that we continue to praise thee, that we continue to live in prayer, to live in your word and Dear Lord, we just pray that you will help us to touch those around us in our lives. Pray that you'll be with this congregation, dear Lord. Help it to grow and thrive. And dear Lord, we just pray that you will help us to be able to help those who are in need. And dear Lord, we pray that you'll be with those who are not here today. Be from sickness, give them the strength and overcome it. And be from spiritual weakness, dear Lord. Not only give them the strength and encouragement through your word, but give us the ability, the, the, the uh, ability to be able to talk to them, dear Lord, to be able to, to bring them back to you, to touch their hearts, to be able to love them in the way that we should, to be able to bring them into your fold. Dear Lord, we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Just have a, a few announcements, which... I don't seem to have my announcement list up here. <laughs> Way over here. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so, for one, we'd like to welcome visitors. Um, we definitely want to to invite you all to stay and, and talk and hang out. Uh, we also want to remind everybody polishing the pulpit. The pulpit, the early uh, bird registration is open. Uh, you save money on it if you do it early. All that information is on the bulletin board. Uh, the 2022 winter retreat at the Midnight Sun Bible Camp is February 19th through the 21st. Everyone is invited. And again, details are on the bulletin board. Um, our gospel meeting month was decided to be in May. Uh, we're still waiting for further details and exact dates on that, uh, but we uh, look, definitely look forward to that. Um, we need, need to remember all those on our prayer list, and there's a list uh, in the bulletins, so keep that in mind. Uh, Barbara Burkhart, friend of Linda Harris, has been hospitalized this Tuesday with serious health and blood sugar issues. I know blood sugar is nothing to, you know, it can turn pretty bad pretty quick, so let's keep her in your prayers. Uh, there's still a couple months, I think two months opening uh, for communion 
again, if sign up, if you can't do it every day, you know, every Sunday, whatever, I mean, I'm sure we can work something out where we team up on that. Uh, Brotherton's February thank you letters on the bulletin. Uh, March cards are on the table. Make sure we all sign those cards. Uh, Helen Ford's not feeling well. Um, she didn't come in today. She said she had a headache. Let's pray for her health and her spiritual wellness. I know she's gone through a lot, so let's just uh, keep her in your prayers. Um, keep Aaron in your prayers. He'll be flying home Monday night, I think. Tuesday morning. Okay, so Monday night. It ain't it ain't day totally, you know. <laughs> so keep him in your prayers. Uh, keep uh, Anthony in your prayers uh, for finding employment, and uh, definitely every day we need to pray for our congregation. Just keep praying and praying, and that we do what's right, and we in the Lord's eyes, and we keep growing. So uh, with that, uh, we are dismissed. Thank you.